Hey everybody, welcome to the PC Perspective Podcast. This is episode 294, being recorded on April 2nd, 2014. I'm Ryan Shrout. I'm Jeremy Hellstrom. I'm Josh Walrath. And I'm Alan Malventano. <laughs> I love the transitions today. <laughs> I love the transitions. Uh, we were, I, you know, I thought about it. Um, have we ever recorded a podcast on April 1st? Surely we have. We've been doing this for like 13 years now or something. It would seem inevitable that there would have been a Wednesday on April 1st. I I was thinking it's like all kinds of funny things we could have done on the podcast. But then, you know, if people are downloading it the next day, it's not April Fool's anymore. They might might miss out on some of the But we're not funny. And also we're not funny. Maybe maybe Josh. No, he's just funny looking. Ken's funny. Ken's funny. He's funny. Ha ha. Funny. Ha ha. (laughs) <laughs> um, so uh, everybody, I was uh, when I sent out the email th- to the day for the live edition. I said everybody's in their correct space, but clearly, based on Alan's voice, Alan, say something for the crowd. Hi, Alan is not in his correct location. He is instead in a dark corner of the woods in Augusta, Georgia, apparently. Um, uh, so his audio will be a little bit lower quality than normal, as you might expect. So. That's just what happens when you're in Georgia, apparently. Uh, We are recording this live on Wednesday around 10 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Pacific. If you want to join us live, which you should, it's so much fun. You can join in the chat. Uh, Sometimes we respond to you. Sometimes we ignore you. Sometimes we taunt you and vice versa. Um, But if you want to sign up for our mailing list, let you know when we're going to go live with the podcast or any other event, you can go to pcper.com slash live, which you can see here. cannot... Oh, I'm sorry. PCPro.com slash live is where you go to watch it. PCPro.com slash subscribe is where you go to subscribe. Like that. Right? So you give us your name, your email address. That's all it is. Uh, and you get put onto a little mailing list that we send out somewhere between an hour and five seconds before we actually go live, depending on when I remember to do it. But that's all we use the mailing list for. So no worries about, uh, uh, you know, Josh doesn't have access to it because he can't send out, you know, surveys and requests for uh kickstarters and things like that so totally cool totally cool that way um so that's how you can get uh privy to where we're going to be and when but let's go ahead and jump into our articles our reviews things that happened during the week it was a busier week than i kind of expected uh, which is good it's a positive thing Uh, we'll start with uh, a review that maury posted he's been on a um, self-contained water cooling kick if you will recently and he's been on a riding kick yeah you know we wouldn't have any content if it weren't for maury this is very true there are are spans of time where i look at the list it's like well what am i going to publish today it's like oh here's another maury article okay well josh is obviously falling behind but there's another Maury. (laughs) really that's never happened (laughs) (sighs) jeremy keeps the news going every day he does maury keeps the reviews going for us uh alan uh, Alan, are you he there? Does, he so? doesn't even look pretty. But. The rest of you guys, you don't even look pretty, so I'm not sure what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. We should get prettier people on this show. Ooh, I mean, a Kickstarter is... for booze reviews. Ooh. That's an excellent, excellent idea. You cannot use my friends. mailing list for that. You cannot use my yes. mailing list for that. Yeah. But yeah. that's for a good purpose. It is. Did we talk really? about on the show how angry you were at me for having all of the uh, Pappy Van Winkle? That was just jealousy. Oh, okay. Well, anger. That's right. I wasn't on that episode, was I? No. I posted the picture on Facebook that you guys all yep. got to see. Yeah. W- we made it your pick of the week. Oh, word. you made it my pick yeah. of yeah. the week. <laughs> good, good. Glad to know. It was really good, by the way. I preferred the 20 over the 25, or the, over the 23. Um, couldn't tell you exactly why, but the 20, we tried 15, 20, and 23, and the 20 was my favorite. So, Congratulations. Also... Uh, we had had two glasses of uh, bourbon before that, and then they brought out all that. And I was like, well, we've obviously got to try the 15 to 20 and 23. So we left after dinner having had five glasses of bourbon. It was, uh, it was a lot, actually. Don't recommend it. Spread oh, that I stuff out. I hardly recommend it. I, I would spread it out over a longer period of time if I were to do it again. Uh, anyway, back to Maury's review of the Cooler Master uh, <clears throat> Glacier. Are we going to call this Glace, Glacier 240L all-in-one liquid cooler? Uh, you can see here. It's kind of a beast, right? Uh, Are you sure it's not Glacker? I, I'm not sure, but I'm going to go with Glacier. 
because it sounds like something would be related to cooling things down. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you look at some of the specs here, uh, it is a uh, uh, 120 by 120. Nope, that's not right. No, there's an individual fans here, each running at 2,400 RPM. Uh, fairly good pump, going up to 3,500 RPM. The cooler itself is, you know, kind of what you've seen before, high-performance expandable system, which is kind of interesting. 240-millimeter uh, radiator, you know, designed for the over, you know, high wattage overclocking CPUs, which most of these, especially the 240s, are going to are going to are going to take advantage of. Radiator had had a fairly good design. I I, I was more impressed with this part right here. You see this this um, actually allows you to expand the radiator and add other components to it. So it's not a completely closed loop like you've seen in other designs. This isn't the first one to do that. Um, I think. But it's the first one that I have really been aware of and kind of paid attention to. Um, and I think this is what Mori used in the Poseidon GTX 780 review last week as part of that. I think that's what he did. Or we're going to have a follow-up using that, right? Because we wanted to see, is the expandability of this Cooler Master water cooler actually useful for something? And you can see, if you look at it in this profile shot, it's much taller in terms of its pump and everything than... The most of the ones that we have around here, at least, right? The the ones that, uh, you know, we have, of course, our H100 and H100i and everything. Mori loves his photos. I, this doesn't have, like, a super high-tech look. It has more of, I think, an industrial look to it. But I think it kind of gives the impression that it's uh, it provides more power, provides more cooling for the giant CPU. It looks like it belongs thing. on Dino De Laurentiis's Dune. Okay. Yeah. I would agree with that. I'm, so, I'm Mr. Mr. Lynch, way to go with the industrial design for everything. <laughs> um, so he goes through the installation process, goes through performance analysis. You guys should definitely check that out. Uh, it's, it seems like a really good product. Um, I don't know if – I think one of the things that, that he is finding with a lot of these self-contained water coolers is that the performance – doesn't vary as much from unit to unit as you might expect. Uh, so here, like if you look at the Ivy Bridge CPU stock settings, the uh, uh, Cooler Master Glacier 240L with the quad fan setup is the best, uh, but only by a couple of degrees under load. Uh, under an overclocked, you know, it ties the thermal right silver arrow, but it's three degrees uh, less than the dual fan configuration, right? So uh, and then compared to the Corsair H100i, it's actually pretty substantial nine degrees Celsius lower on temperature on Ivy Bridge performance. And he has some Haswell performance results in here as well. Uh, fan noise, obviously with the quad fan is going to be significantly higher than with the dual fan up to 58 dBA, um, which is still one lower than that standard heatsink thermal right silver arrow SBE. So uh, overall, I think a, a pretty impressive system or pretty impressive cooler rather. It's $139 on Newegg and Amazon. It's on the high side, but it's not outside of uh, one, many of the other coolers we've seen in recent past. It was good enough to get a gold award, award from Mori. Um, and you can see some of his slight weaknesses there. Horizontal width of the CPU block was pretty tall, as, you show, as we saw in the photos there. Low uh, density on the radiator, the fins, and uh, lack of DIY information and manual for adding components to the loop. So even though it had expandability, the instructions for it maybe weren't as good as they should have been for expanding it. So that was, that's pretty neat. Uh, I, I, none of you guys have actually used that particular unit, I assume? Nope. Yeah. I've only used two, the what? Silverstone and the uh, Antec Cooler. Cooler, K U H L. The cooler was fine. It yeah. just the fan got crappy fast, and the uh, mm. Silverstone is it's thick. It's got high fan density, but I couldn't tell you how it compares to that. Maury seemed to like it, and he looks at a lot of these, so he does. Take that for what you will. Uh, another review that went up this week is from a uh, newbie to the site, Sebastian Peak. This is actually his second article on the website. I think a couple weeks ago we talked about. Um, the memory story that he did on the, uh, what was it, HyperX, Kingston HyperX memory, 2600 megahertz memory or something crazy like that. Uh, this is the BitPhoenix Colossus Micro ATX case. And uh, it's an interesting beast, right? This is not mini ITX. This is not full size. This is micro ATX. And uh, actually, surprisingly, mini motherboards, especially for people that are building low-cost systems, uh, are micro ATX still to this day. Uh, this is, I think, 
an interesting combination of steel and plastic. If you if you look at the shot up here at the at the front, it has an interesting kind of very specific look to it. And I think a lot of the Bit Phoenix designs that they have come out with have a very very specific look to them. And of course, some of the pictures didn't load on that page. Um, but you can see here, like, and this white bar actually lights up and in, in, into various colors that you can select. Uh, and it's got, I don't know, what, what do you think about having the USB and power button and I.O., like the audio I.O. on the side of the case as opposed to the front? It definitely makes the front look clean, uh, but he was a little bit hesitant for the award on it because it makes, you actually have to remove this side of the panel when you want to access the components, right? So that's not the back of the case. That's the, the side where you're, you know, you install your graphics card and all that kind of stuff. So anytime you want to make changes, you kind of have to be a little bit careful with the cables and stuff that connect there. Would you, I mean, would you rather see that on the front still, or do you like kind of the aesthetic of seeing that kind of stuff on the side? I would like it on the front because, okay, say I've got my case to my right hand side. So I want to plug something in. I got to get up off of my behind Okay. And walk around and plug Depending it in. Depending on your sure placement of the case to where you sit, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. so, okay, but let's say I've got it on the uh, left side of my desk. Okay. Well, obviously, Wicked. I've got to move it quite a bit farther away from the left side of my desk just to be able to plug stuff in and to reach the power button. You can't have it where your right knee close. is. Yeah. I would worry about maybe like having your leg break off a USB thumb drive that's installed or something like that. Been there, done that. <laughs> yeah, have you? <laughs> yep. You guys, also, uh, like the side mounts. Go ahead, Alan. You, got, you guys seen those Antec cases, like the, you know, the ones with the huge fan at the top rear, right? Yeah. Well, they have, uh, they tend to relocate them to the top. So it's like the mm. top front, basically. You get a couple yeah. of USB ports and the audio, which is very handy. Yeah. It's a different location than just the front. But I think that's the only other good location. The sides seem kind of weird. Yeah. If you look at the back of it, you can kind of see the other change to this case is that it's upside down and backwards. <laughs> Surprise. Um, yeah, it's actually got, you can see the bottom here. There's actually uh, fan filters there as well. The power supply is bottom mounted. You can see there's a plug right here, but the uh, power supply actually faces down. Um, Let's go ahead and take a look at, uh, go on to the inside of the case where you can see that everything is upside down. So here's here's that uh, cable clutter, if you will, on the side panel. You know, So you've got, these are the cables, like the USB 3 header and the audio header and stuff that connect to the motherboard. I kind of, kind of like having access to them, not having to like, if something were to break on them, that's much easier to access than going into the front panel of the case and trying to remove the front panel. Usually it involves breaking clips off and then me being very angry at myself for breaking the case. Um, but it, you can kind of see it there. But then when you, let's see, when we get to the actual installation portion, what page is that on? Here we go. Um, see, it's upside down. And here he actually shows it with a mini ITX case or the mi or mini ITX motherboard or micro ATX motherboard here, um, and uh, goes through the whole installation process there. It's it's kind of interesting. I don't know if the upside downness changes anything, in my opinion, right? I don't know if it changes the thermals drastically. Uh, installation wise, it didn't seem to be that big of a problem. But uh, Sebastian liked the case. Uh, it's going to run you. Oh, here's a picture of the lighting. You can make it red or green or blue. Eh? Eh? It's not too bad. Um, not a very expensive system, uh, case. $120 shipped is not too bad. It's not on the cheap end of things either. So uh, if for, for budget users, this may not be the best, the best option. But uh, check out the review. Uh, it goes into all the detail of positives and negatives of the design. So uh, another good job by new guy there. Now let's talk to Alan uh, from Backwoods, uh, Georgia. Not always, just tonight. I mean, I'm not trying to insult him necessarily. <laughs> if you hear the banjos, Alan, start running. Don't worry about the guy. podcast. Oh, you did? That's bad news for you. Do you have your blinds shut? Yes. Okay, good. So um, a new SSD was launched this week, a new series of SSDs, the ADATA Premiere Pro. SP920s. So tell us a little bit about this. What is unique and new about these and how they perform? Actually, here's what's interesting. There's nothing unique and new about this model. 
Now, okay. the model name and the fact that it comes from ADATA, ADATA, that's new. But this is a Marvell controller, the SATA 6 gigabit Marvell controller. Uh, it's not a new controller. It's one that's been around for a while. Okay. It's, uh, it's just standard Micron flash memory inside. Nothing new, no process shrink, nothing new there either. Uh, but the thing is that that controller has matured a lot since it, since it launched. So uh, the performance is actually quite good. So ADATA just had to package it up and try to make it cheaper than what it's selling for in other places, or at least be competitive, and that seems to be what they've done here. And uh, when we did tested all the capacities, it it really is a pretty good performing drive. It's, it's, hey, uh, hey, Alan. Alan? Yeah. H- how many screws are on it? Can, can you <laughs> lift it up? <laughs> eight screws. It has eight screws. One, nice. two... Three. Yes, you got. I'll do the picture with the arrows that appear as I as I count them. Um, so uh, the uh, half a terabyte and one terabyte capacities. Uh, that's another thing that's actually cool is it's available in a one terabyte capacity. Um, they perform almost exactly the same amongst those two capacities, and you'll get the best performance from those two. Uh, when you drop down to two fifty six, the write speeds taper off just a little bit. I'd say maybe like eighty percent of what the top, what the top two tiers gives you, uh, and then when you drop down to the 128 gig model, uh, there's you start getting into territory where there's much fewer dies for the controller to spread the writes across. Hmm. So the write speeds start to suffer, and you end up with the performances. You know, well, like in our fault creation benchmark right there, the yeah. write performance is about half. So it's actually a quite a slow drive for the 128 gig model, but the reads are still very good. The random I.O. performance is still very good, even on that smaller model. It's just that the writes kind of suffer. Interesting. Yeah, but the performance was very good. If you go to the I.O. meter page, you'll see it's, it's, uh, the top two tiers are right up there with the Intel 730 series even, which is their overclocked enterprise controller. I mean, is this... I think we had this conversation when this review, when we were working on it, that Marvell's controllers tend to get better later as opposed to launching better? Yeah, they, they tend, from what, from what I've seen, they will launch, uh, they, they don't, they don't generally have issues with firmware, so to speak, but when they launch, their performance will be, you know, kind of so-so. That's usually the, the gut feel I get when I run one of the, the new models of theirs through the benches. And then, uh, just over time, they come out with firmwares and, uh, you know, they, they, you end up with like step increases in performance, uh, just optimization after the fact, I would suppose. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, what about as, as compared to Sandforce, which they come out great, but then after a couple of firmwares, they get really crappy. <laughs> well, <laughs> they have to slow. Sandforce has to slow their drives down so that they don't uh, turn into bricks, and uh, you know, do other things. So yeah, they they. That's the other example of optimizing firmware over time, right? Is, uh, oh, our drives are failing. Crap, we better, we better fix that problem. Uh, by the way, I only see four screws on this picture. <laughs> There's four inside the housing. Okay, all right. Uh, what about pricing? <laughs> what about pricing and availability and that stuff? How's this? So the pricing, the pricing is really, really good, actually. Uh, the higher you go, the cheaper they get, all the way to just over 50 cents a gig on one terabyte. And that's kind of the opposite of prostitution, right? Yeah, basically. Yeah. yeah the bigger... Yeah, no, I get it. No. Yeah, no, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, are these... Have we seen these actually for sale yet? Are these, uh, like, available for sale, or is it going to be a couple of days before we uh, get them in the channel? I don't know. They, they um... I mean, we've had samples for a little while, uh, but they might not be on Newegg just yet. Okay. I haven't checked since the... Since we posted. Yeah, I don't see anything listed on Amazon under SP920, but that might be a very generic term that uh, is difficult for it to parse. Yeah. Let's see. Oh, I, no. would say, I do so see Premiere Pro, 256 gig. Uh, it looks like it's just starting to become available. It's listed as shipping in two to four weeks uh, for the 256 for 159, which is exactly MSRP. So. Okay. Yeah. That's still not a bad price, though. And, yeah. Um, and then... You kind of have, I I would say, keep an eye on these and see if vendors are, it's not like there's going to be so much demand for this particular drive because it's ADATA and they're not 
super well known right. for solid state drives, right? So if you keep an eye on this, you're getting a pretty solid drive. It's not like they re engineered anything. They're just it's basically a Marvell drive with just a you know brand different branding. How's this compare to the uh, M500? So the performance should be the same. Okay. Uh, we don't we don't have a comparison to go off of, but it's the hardware is the same. I don't okay. uh, Adata doesn't engineer their own firmware, so it should basically be the same drive. Gotcha. Very cool. Uh, let's see what was our next. Oh, hey, that's me. Um, the next story is uh, frame rating Battlefield Four Mantle Crossfire early performance with FCAT. That's a whole lot of words. Um, so as it turns out, Battlefield 4 released a new patch. I think it was on March 31st. Uh, it's a bad idea to release a patch to a game on April 1st. Just, any, you know, I don't release news, don't release products on April 1st. It's a bad thing. So on March 31st, uh, Battlefield 4 updated with a new patch. It had some fixes and improved mantle performance and some other areas. But what it turned out it also did, that I don't think many people knew, I don't know if anybody knew yet, was that uh, DICE integrated into the Frostbite engine for Battlefield, uh, the ability to add the FCAT-style overlay required for our capture-based frame rating style of performance. If you remember back when we first started talking about Mantle and we first started looking at Mantle performance in January and February, um, one of the issues was we couldn't use our you know, PC Perspective's kind of standardized custom uh, testing methodologies, right? Because with Mantle, it doesn't use DirectX, it doesn't use OpenGL, so we didn't have an, an overlay, a piece of overlay software that would allow us to measure performance through the external capture system, and instead we had to use a, you know, built into the engine uh, frame time logging thing that uh, uh, that they put in there for us as well. But with this release, they introduced the FCAT overlay. So now, in Battlefield 4, you can go into the console and type in a command, uh, what is it, perf overlay dot draw fcat 1 to turn it on and 0 to turn it off. That works in Mantle, that works in Direct3D, uh, and what it produces is the colored bars on the side that allow us to measure performance through capture that we couldn't do otherwise. Now, this is pretty interesting, right, because it's allowing us to look at multi-GPU performance in a way that we haven't been able to look at with Mantle at all up until this point, right? So getting average frame rates doesn't really help much in multi-GPU performance as we have discussed over the last, I don't know, 18 to months to 24 months. Um, and, you know, to be honest with you, the, the, the results that these uh, tests that I ran show are not fantastic. Right, they're interesting <clears throat> for in a couple of ways that we'll talk about, um, but they're not uh, jumping out at us and saying, "Wow, look at what a great job AMD and 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 Dice and Battlefield 4 are doing with multi GPU and Mantle." And in fact, it's a little bit the opposite. But they were still, you know, willing to to put this capability out here. It would have been entirely possible for them to just like, eh, you know, what we're not gonna we're not gonna put that in this time. Um, but Dice, and in particular, uh, Johan Anderson, the, the main developer that I was kind of talking with about integrating this type of stuff, was willing to do it. You know, he sees the benefits of smooth gaming and uh, and wants help kind of forcing the issue along and making sure that that people see the benefits of smooth gaming that they're implementing it in the best way. So if we take a look at um, our results here, uh, if we look at like first things first, 1920 by 1080, Battlefield 4. This is a 290X and 290X Crossfire running on a core i7-3960X. So this is a high-end processor with a high-end graphics card. And the first thing to notice here is like the black line versus the pink line. Um, black line is a little bit higher. That is single card mantle. The pink line is single card direct 3D. So we're seeing a, a 4 to 5% performance advantage with mantle over direct 3D single card. That's that's pretty good. That's not that's not too bad. Again, considering we're looking at high end graphics, high end processor. <clears throat> what is disappointing or interesting is the green line up top here is the DirectX 11 Crossfire implementation. You can see it's a pretty good jump from the pink line to the green line. You're seeing performance scaling. You're seeing advantages of Crossfire. But the orange line is Crossfire with Mantle. And a couple things is it's barely higher than the black line of a single card. And it's also very, very flat. There's no variance in there. And if actually it's kind of showcased even more, 
in the frame times graph here, where you can see uh, the green line of DirectX Crossfire has some variance. Uh, the, the thicker the line, the kind of the worse the variance, right? And that's this is enough to kind of notice some stutters and pops throughout gaming. But if you look at that orange line, let's see if I can, uh, I'll zoom in on this a little bit more. The orange line there is very, very consistent. Very little frame time variance on this, but it's not improving performance over single GPU really, right? So um, keep that in mind as, as we as we kind of I don't know. Look how flat that is. It's it's. I mean, if you're, it's if, oddly if, if, flat. Yeah, it's and the, I mean, just the variance in between frame time to frame time is super almost impressive. nothing. Almost nothing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, it's interesting. I mean, it's not perhaps optimal. Well, it's not right. But look at twenty five sixty by fourteen forty. So now we are increasing the you know the load on the GPU sum and the black and pink lines again of single GPU. You can see there that the mantle provides some performance advantage. Um, and now when we look at Crossfire with DirectX and with Mantle, there is some scaling. Right, we're going from the black line to the orange line. There's still scaling there, but it's flat again. Right, very very um, homogeneous the entire way across. And again, if you look at the frame times graph, you can kind of see this in a totally different way. And this is this is the the vision of the performance we could not see really before they implemented uh, the FCAT overlay support. Yeah, that's so, like the A cup of variance. <laughs> it's very tiny. It's very, very minimal. Fun. Hard to see, um, but it's still attractive. What's interesting about it is the variance being so low is actually a good thing, right? Low variance means that your frame rate is consistent, right? It's like over this, you know, 52 second period, the frame rate is basically, you know, at 13 to 14 milliseconds, you know, all the way across with almost no variance to it. And the DirectX one sees a lot of variance. Now, there are some cases like if you look at the beginning here, it's running at better performance, right? Right here. The, the frame time is lower, so it's better performing, but there's more variance. You know, it's better performing throughout all this, but you see there's lots of spikes in frame time that, that do not exist in the Mantle version. And that's kind of weird, right? So my summation after looking at this data is that what it appears that they have done is focus on reliability of the frame pacing as opposed to reliability of increased performance as a whole, right? Uh, I found out after publishing this that there are apparently three modes of frame pacing that you can enable through the console in this. Uh, I don't remember the, the command right now, but uh, some people tweeted out to me and sent me to some forum threads as well. And actually, um, Johan commented to me, to me about them as well. The problem is, is they don't really want to talk about which, what specifically each of those options is, are doing because they're not finalized and they're still, you know, AMD and and, uh, and EA and, and Dice and everybody involved are basically saying, hey, look, we're still working on this. Here's where we're at so far. Um, but it seems to me that what is happening is somebody is very concerned about frame time variance. They want that to not be an issue. Stutter, jitter, runs. None of that. They don't want any of that to happen. But as a result, they're kind of limiting the performance scaling of multi-GPU a little bit, right? Um, and this happens to a similar, in a similar fashion with uh, a lower end processor like the A10-7850K, which you guys can go um, to the site and look up those results if you want as well. I mean, Josh, does that make sense, the kind of theory that I came up with? Summarize that again. I was typing. Uh, that the... The, the flatness of the line that we see with Mantle Crossfire, especially at the higher resolution, indicates that they are prioritizing very, very, very low frame time variants and are sacrificing some performance in order to make sure that they are maintaining that very, very low variance. Well, let me ask you a question. <clears throat> okay. What is NVIDIA trying to do with G-Sync and how does that relate to this? And especially when it comes to perception and even slight variances in how we perceive motion. I don't, I don't know. I don't know how they're related, right? So, Well, I mean, there's so little variance in between that. And so each frame delivery is 
consistent. It's like William Shatner delivering a bunch of lines. You know what's coming next. Yeah. I don't I don't I I guess I don't think I don't think they're related. Well, they're not related, but it it goes to the same thing. It's it's all perception. It's all Yeah. Evenness in between these frames, instead of just like you know, you've got a, a ten millisecond gap in between one frame and the other, and then a two millisecond, and and you're you're kind of seeing these strange, you know, kind of waxing and waning of of frames, and it and it just, I mean, it just, but you can, it, it becomes annoying. You and can so do with like that. G-Sync, they're they're evening things out with this guy. They're yeah. they're obviously evening things out, but. You can do that while still – you can have low frame time variance while still having variable frame rates, right? So if you look at uh, – let me refresh this page here. Um, take a look at this result here. So this is an old graph from an older story, and this is looking at uh, 290X, I think, first release, right? So if you look at this blue line, this is Battlefield 3, not 4. Um, but you're looking at the blue line is GTX 780 Ti 3-gigabyte SLI. And you're looking at the consistency of that line, right? How how wide is that line? How variable is that line? There's a couple of spikes every once in a while. Um, but SLI has done a very good job of maintaining low frame variance. But there's still, you know, this, this is not flat across at, you know, 10 milliseconds or something. There is variance to the performance of the game as a whole. It's varying based on what is happening in the scene. Um, if you look you know, at it, I, 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 I understand world. what you're saying, but I guess the other thing I'm going to throw in here is he said, well, and this is Johan, mm -hmm. he said, well, there are three different things that you can do, you Correct. know, use this one. Now, what if this lack of variance is more of an artifact of how they're doing it rather than something that they're really pursuing? Could be. Yeah. I mean, that, that's, that's, that very well could be because it is still stuff that is in development and they're working on fixing it. I mean, he was very upfront and honest when he told me about it. He said, like, hey, here's how you enable it. Uh, it's still a work in progress. It's not perfected in any fashion, right? But um, for me, I was like, yeah, uh, you know, thank you, but let, we're going to use this. And I think it's important to set a baseline for where do we sit with frame pacing performance today with Mantle um, and where where will we go with, with future updates, right? So I, it very well could be an artifact of something as opposed to what they were trying to do, what they decided to do or something to that matter, right? Um, I don't know. I still think that's kind of cool when you graph it out. It is. I mean, and, and it was, again, this is something we would not be able to see or even discuss without having, you know, them implement FCAT type overlay in there. Uh, I had been talking with AMD since they first told me about Mantle, but hey, you should probably make an overlay software for this. They seem very uninterested. In doing so, surprisingly. Um, so a lot of credit goes out to, to Johan and the guys over at DICE to push this and get it out there and integrate it. So hopefully uh, this will either push AMD to kind of release a mantle version of uh, an overlay or, um, you know, all the individual game developers to kind of put this into their engine so that we can, again, evaluate software on an, on an apples to apples basis. So it's a pretty interesting read if you go uh, check that out. We would appreciate it as well. And then, of course, we have to talk again this week about DirectX 12. Uh, Josh, you just posted an editorial this evening with yes. no tags on it, I noticed. So, Johnny, come, one, no tags? No tags. I had all kinds of tags. Uh, I'm looking at the story. There are no tags. Look at this right here. See this? Tagged blank. Boo. No. Tagged no. Blank. I think what happened is... Uh, <clears throat> I, I started it and I put all the tags in, except I didn't check make this a multi-page review. Ooh, and so I yeah, made so it and then it. I'm like, oh, I hit back, made it a multi-page review and saved, and I guess it just deleted all the tags. I don't But you know what? I'll fix that. Yeah, you do that later. Uh so, yeah. so uh give me a quick overview. What has changed in your thoughts on DirectX twelve over the last couple of weeks? Nothing. Cool, let's move on. Uh all today's right. oh. Go ahead. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, since you know Microsoft released this, and we knew a couple of days in advance that Microsoft would be doing this, and what? you know there were a lot of th theoretical thoughts moving about that, you know perhaps AMD's mantle pushed this to the fore, and uh, you know I, I talk about some history of DirectX, how DX11 was released in 2009, and we have not seen really anything except two minor iterations 
of DX 11.1 and 11.2. In that time, we hadn't heard a whole lot of movement from any of the companies moving past DX 11. And then we come to, you know, the Xbox One, and it's DX 11 based, and we're just going to focus on that for a while. <clears throat> and then along comes AMD back in, what, September? They released True Audio, uh, the 290X, and then Mantle. And uh, I think it provided some serious impetus to the market. And it wasn't just AMD, because the Xbox One had some performance limitations as compared to the PS4. And there are some issues there. And there are developers who are very unhappy about the, the tools that Microsoft has provided for the Xbox One. And then we also look at, uh, say, Surface and the Surface 2, and perhaps Windows Phone. Yes. These things have not gathered any kind of momentum in the industry other than just a couple of bumps. And so I think that Microsoft really kind of got their stuff together in the past year and said, you know what, we need something to not only unify all these platforms, but to provide an impetus for development, for support, for getting software out here that, that is going to make these products exciting and we need to set a foundation. And so AMD, of course, you know, they, they helped out with Mantle in that they have exposed developers to you know, a lower level API. And so when you kind of take all of these things together, um, you know, Microsoft really didn't have much of a choice except to push DX12 forward. I think that my theory in my article <clears throat> is that DX12 was going to be released a couple of years down the road as, as more of a midlife boost for the Xbox One. You update the OS, you, you update a low-level software, and developers now have a lot more tools to use to, to make interesting content that will kind of help propel the Xbox One against the competition, as well as, you know, you give it a nice midlife jump in terms of sales and uh, visibility. And so uh, I went over very quickly some of the advantages in uh, DX12. We talked about a lot of this before. You know, it's a low, lower level API. Uh, developers can, can manage um, objects and... Uh, uh, memory addresses yeah. in a, a much more uh, granular way than what we're used to because, for example, say, okay, I want to put these textures here and you tell that to DX and DX is like, all right, well, I might put them here. But you know what? If you want to access them, you got to access them through me because I know where they're at and you as the program, you don't know. And so you've got to go through me to get the stuff you want. Yeah. I mean, it's like the worst pusher in the world. <laughs> Story of my and, life. Yeah, yeah. And so uh, uh, um, <clears throat> it's a lot more efficient with, uh, you know, them being able to control these things. And, uh, you know, draw calls are, are going to improve immensely. You're going to have more objects, more interesting objects uh, per scene. I mean, it's just uh, a lot of good things that they're doing, and it really needed to be done to push software and hardware further. Now, what we don't know is what other features that DirectX 12 is going to deliver. There were some people who thought, oh, great, this is, you know, DX12 is just going to be this low-level stuff, but we're not going to get any new and interesting uh, features and functionality that will make our scenes yeah. all that much better. We're just going to have more stuff, and it's going to run faster because it's more efficient. Well, that's, that's not true. Uh, Microsoft has not released what they're doing. Uh, we haven't heard anything, obviously, from AMD, NVIDIA, Intel, and Qualcomm about what this next iteration is going to be. But there will be more features. And I think they did uh, give us a slide that teased a few of uh, the things, but it was only yeah. like two, and I can't remember right offhand. Programmable, blend, and efficient uh, order independent transparency with pixel ordered UAV. And better collision and culling with conservative rasterization. It's better if you should yeah. capture. Yeah. So, I mean, you're going to have to have new hardware to be able to utilize these features. And this is just kind of the tip of the iceberg. 
Uh, they're going to release more stuff. And just as we've always kind of thought and assumed, we're going to see more and more subtle details come out in each generation to make things look more realistic without going towards full-ass ray, ray tracing. Now, you say in uh, on the first page, AMD does not want to have to curate an API. It's a waste of resources for AMD in the long term. Um, do, you, do you think that, you know, they're, they're going to continue to push Mantle. It is a, an advantage that they have over the competition now, at the very least until DirectX 12 launches sometime next year. Do you see Mantle continuing to exist after that and anything more than you know a feature on the box that they continue to add support for? I can't really see it because DirectX 12 will cover most of the bases that Mantle already does. And so it makes no sense for a developer to develop for both DirectX 12 and Mantle when they could just get the vast majority of those features with DirectX 12. Now, the only way that right. AMD could make Mantle survive is if they included a lot more features over DirectX 12 that will be exposed in Mantle mm -hmm. and get a handful of developers of popular games like the Battlefield series to natively support them to kind of give them an edge up. Now, I don't know if they would do that. I don't know if it is worth their time to do that. And, uh, the developers or AMD, for that matter. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Because from here till holiday 2015, we will see AMD improve Mantle. We're going to see the developers that will utilize Mantle also improve their implementations. And by doing so, they're going to gain experience on how to program their engines for these low-level interactions without a big, fat DirectX uh, <laughs> layer sitting in between them, telling them what they can and can't do. Um, but once DX12 comes, you know, those advantages are, are going to shrink. Right. And uh, most people are probably just going to say, hey, let's just stick with DX12 because not only will it work on AMD parts, it's going to be NVIDIA, it's going to be Intel. Uh, you know, I can, I can port this stuff over to a Windows phone that's based on a, a Qualcomm Adreno uh, piece of hardware. And so it makes... Not a whole lot of sense to do Mantle, but until that point, AMD does have a pretty good checkbox. They do have some pretty decent developers utilizing Mantle and pushing that in their applications. And it kind of goes in hand in hand with, you know, they're, you're, you're going to push Mantle. Hey, look at this true audio stuff. Why don't you kind of look at that and see if you can add value to your game and add value to our products by putting that in. So... Interesting. It's it's going to be interesting to see. Yeah. Uh, Josh has more detail in his article, which you can see at PCPer.com, which is a super amazing, awesome website. Uh, before we go any further, we're going to talk about a handful of news items this week. We do have to thank our podcast sponsor, our very, very, very amazingly good friend, Rajiv, would like to tell us about their headsets. Uh, and uh, hopefully we're going to get some of them in for us to use. That'd hopefully, be nice. Hopefully he's listening right now, right before we do hint, that. Hint, hint. The Pulsar Aluminum Gaming Headset by Cooler Master features 42mm drivers that deliver clear highs and powerful bass, immersing you in the action for a perfected audio experience. The aluminum ear plates can be customized to your personal style for a truly unique look. Built for customization and optimized for sound, you can learn more about the Pulsar at coolermaster-usa.com. All right. Thank you very much, Rajiv. Uh, we have an idea. We want PC Perspective logos painted on the sides of the headsets. What do you think? In chartreuse. Yes. But not done by us, right? Oh, no. God, no. Uh, maybe embossed in gold flakes. Alan, would that help out your image quality any? Probably not. <laughs> How about gold members? Gold members would get a gold flaked headset. Sure, as long as I don't have to see it. Okay, maybe That's not one. the member I thought you were talking about. Oh, oh yeah, I wasn't. Oh. I yeah, I didn't even follow. Yeah, no, I was going the whole dirty route because Josh was talking. No, 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 no. PC perspective, gold members, gold but members. not PC perspectives, gold member. 
No, that's I, a little I, too I, Austin Powers for you. Yes, our, our collective member. <laughs> hey, oof. all right. Um, so let's talk about news now that we have Jeremy's dulcet tones in my ear. Um, Valve doesn't have people anymore. It's true. It, and all I of don't the people are going to be doing wearables either, because Jerry and uh, who Michael left were now? the two that were doing the wearables originally. So Michael Abrash has left Valve. Um, I guess he was only hired there in 2011, right? Uh, but he was one of the the two people kind of pushing the wearable computing initiative, right? Mm-hmm. Where'd he go? Well, he's disappeared. He's he's just not on the planet anymore. I believe, uh, as far as we know, he's sort of going to be working at Oculus and at Valve for a little bit. Obviously, he's not going to be doing double duty for too long. Yeah. So it's it's going to be interesting, and it's yet another uh, f- relatively in the know tech voice coming out and saying this whole Facebook purchase. Maybe not is not as icky as you think it is. Uh, I certainly hope that's the case. You would think but. with somebody of his caliber would not sign on. At, you know, obviously he knew about that acquisition potentially happening during the discussions of him going to that company, right? Yeah. Uh, it wasn't like he got hired one day and they said, "Oh, by the way, today you're now working for Facebook." Um, so I would it would lend credibility to the acquisition of Oculus from uh, by Facebook. To uh, uh, that they aren't going it, to the at the very least they're not going to screw up the path that they're on. Maybe they'll add other things, but they would continue down the path that they're on. I don't know. It's inter- it's interesting stuff. Um, yeah, they've they've got a financial backer with multi billions that they yeah. can draw upon, as compared to just hey, let's do a Kickstarter and hope we can make a certain amount of money. <laughs> I mean, would do to that. be fair, they raised two point something million dollars. Is that right on the Kickstarter, and the, and they just got sold for two billion dollars. Yep, that's pretty good. Did, did Did you see your check in the mail? I got my check. Yeah, no, I got it. Yeah, for my. That makes sense because I mean, Valve and wearable computing. Your, I just have never ever understood. Refund, right? <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, now, okay, here's a thing. Uh, a post that. Uh, Scott made on GDC 2014 shader limited optimizations for AMD's GCN. Anybody understand what is in this news post? There's a diagram. Read it. All right, fine. Uh, I will talk. So, uh, I didn't, I don't know. It is basically a talk from email Pearson. Person? Pearson? Two S's. I'm going to go with Person of Avalanche Studios. Uh, best known for the Just Cause franchise, published his slides and speech from GDC that happened two weeks ago. Uh, his talk focused on AMD's GCN architecture due to its existence in both console and PC while bringing up older GPUs, for examples. Um, talking about the interesting qualities of the GCN architecture when dissected as it was in the presentation. It's more simple than its ancestors. Is that true, Josh? Would you consider GCN more simple than what they did? I guess it's than the VLIW... Four. You know, it's. I guess it's more simple in that it's more. Okay, I hate to use <clears throat> AMD marketing terms. Sure, go for it. But it is more core-like in it how it handles workloads. Okay. You don't have all these. You know, I've got fifteen thousand warps in flight at the same time. It's not like that. So you would say that it is uh, much more CPU-like with resources mapped to memory rather than slots and with how vectors are mostly treated as collections of scalars and so forth. You're just reading. But, <laughs> but yeah, what? I mean, it's no. essentially, I mean, AMD has a point. I mean, it's, it's kind of like a core. It's got a lot of the traditional things that people are used to programming for, except it's really wide in how it executes code. And uh, as long as you feed it code that will handle that amount of parallelism, all those, you know, it's got, what, 4 by 16 wide vector units, which when we look back at, like, what Larrabee tried to do, I mean, it's, in ways, it's similar, but they didn't have to attach an x86 core to it. Right. Uh, 
they implemented everything in there they kind of need to to be able to do uh, some rather interesting code. And so there are things that GCN does better than NVIDIA's uh, Kepler. I mean, namely, I mean, Bitcoiners obviously love it. Uh, yeah. But Scott, yeah, I mean, it's it's the ease of programmability because of just kind of the front end of it and how it handles data. Scott points out at, at the end of it, the, the kind of final note is that developers are learning how to optimize shader compilation on the consoles and carrying it over to the PC. Um, DirectX 12 can't really help that part directly, um, but that's what matters on, as he says, the high-end shader-bound applications, high-resolution, high-complex shaders, things like that. So it's almost like they're kind of addressing performance issues on the GPU side, on the shader-bound side as well by understanding more about the architecture itself. Um, curious to know kind of how these developers, the, like people who get low-level like this, how they, what their thoughts are on what GCN is versus what, say, Kepler is versus what Maxwell is and what NVIDIA's pathway is. Um, because as Josh said, they seem to have gone with a more CPU-like design with GCN than NVIDIA has up till this point, right? Correct. Yeah. Uh, if you like 4K monitors, and frankly, who doesn't love 4K? I mean, 4K everywhere, right, guys? You guys probably have three or four of them at your place. Uh, I know we do here. Wow, I, I saw my first one at CES. It looks like Alan is coming to us on a 4K stream, literally. Yeah, like oh, yeah. four, like four pixels, four four, four thousand pixels total, not across, but four thousand kil kilobits, kilobits. Yeah, um, this deal has changed since we posted this, but for a for a short period of time, there was a Samsung U twenty eight D five nine zero D. I love model numbers. I really love model numbers. A twenty eight inch four K monitor for six hundred ninety nine bucks. Uh, 3840 by 2160 resolution support for 60 hertz refresh rates courtesy of the display port 1.2 connection obviously this is an MST monitor um, it's probably using the same TN panel that we saw many displays using at CES but as I think as we talked with Alan or I brought up with Alan before and maybe it was Josh that the TN panels we saw there were better looking than your standard TN panel yeah because yeah. I mean, in terms of physics of how they have to do TN, it's going to be much, much finer to be able to fit all those pixels in a 28-inch rather than, you know, a 24-inch 1080p, yeah. which is big, fat. They've got deep wells. Well, you can't do that when you're trying to squeeze them all in. And so you don't have that whole color shifting nearly as bad as a TN. Uh, colors do look nicer. So, yeah, it's... It's kind of sad that they're saying, yeah, it's just a TN monitor. It's crap. Well, no, it's I know when, it's we, really talked, not. when we talked with Asus about their 4K monitor, um, Gary was very hesitant to call it just a TN panel because he's like, well, it's, it's, you know, it's, the technology is very similar to that, but it's doing different things, and uh, it has much better image quality properties than just a standard TN panel. But they don't really – this is what happens when you don't let marketing people create a new name and brand for something is – we call it a TN panel, and all the comments go, ah, crap, TN panel, not even, don't even care, when it will have much better quality than what we know of, like if you buy a 1080p, 1080 uh, TN panel for $48. Yeah, it's, right. uh, that was the first thing I did with that one. I think it was a Lenovo panel that we saw in person that was 4K. And the first thing I did was do that number where you're, you know, tilting your head around it. And it was actually pretty darn good like i would compare it to like low grade ips panels mm. really like it was surprisingly good for tn um the this like i said when it, when it, when we wrote this story it was on uh, available on amazon for pre-order for 699 bucks i think it started shipping later this week it has since gone up uh, but it is significantly less than the 2500 hundred dollar asus pq321 which is a ips panel uh, but it's still a displayport mst it's also a 32-inch. It's not IPS? It's what is it? IGZO. Oh, that's right. That's right. It's, it's one of the IGZOs. Okay. Um, but it, ha it has a better image quality than what you would get. But is it $700 versus $2,500 image quality better for, you know, and you're also going from 28 to 32 inches? Um, pretty impressive to see these. Let me, I'm going to click this link and see. Yeah, yeah, it's still, 
I wouldn't pre-order it from BizBuy International. Maybe you have to imagine that Amazon was charging MSRP. So when they actually start showing up in the channel, that's probably what yeah, they'll be. Yeah, yeah, just gouging it on Amazon. Yep. Uh, and there are two new listed for seven ninety nine. Who's selling those? Other people? Nope. Somebody else in stock. I think you're lying. Um, so that's good news. I think we saw price cuts uh, from Dell recently on their twenty eight inch model um the good news is is you're going to be able to get 4k panels much much less expensive than when we bought 4k panels um and they're gonna be able to do 60 hertz so <clears throat> we were big proponents well maybe not big proponents but we were talked about you know like the 30 hertz Seiki tvs that we still use around the office that were 4k um, but they were limited to 30 hertz now you can do 60 hertz which will be uh pretty interesting until of course you know all the guys on wall street decide to buy all of these up. All of them? Because they like the density. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. Uh, I like density. I like density. Yeah. That's why I have you around. Um, <sighs> build 2014. Microsoft presents a new start menu. Who wants to talk about this and their excitement for a Windows 8 start menu? Welcome to the party. Everybody else is already doing it for you. <laughs> yeah, but now they can cut those people out and all those companies' revenues can go to zero. Uh, they're free tools anyway. Oh, really? Stardock well, would differ. Would so Stardock Star yeah. charges Star money. Stardock would differ. And that's yeah, the single most popular Star one. Actually, they undercut Stardock two ways at the same time, if you count it, because they're letting the apps run in windowed mode as well, which was another Stardock uh, thing. Okay. So you can run the apps, the Metro apps, in a window now? Yep, Re I think it looks like resizable windows, which there's actually one sitting on the desktop there. I think that's oh, uh, okay. Yeah, there are yeah. two sitting on the desktop. Ha ha ha! Yeah, I see it there. Interesting that you're just kind of like, hey, you know, hey, we screwed all that up. Sorry, guys. Here's everything yeah. you wanted back. Well, it also came with another major attraction. Was that uh, for IE 11? There is now a corporate mode. So all the security holes that they claim that uh, lack of backward support has closed. They'll actually allow you to run legacy uh, Internet Explorer calls so you don't have to redo your corporate intranet across the globe. Just upgrade to Windows 8. Does this version of Windows 8 include a copy of Windows XP as well? <laughs> uh, not as far as I know. It's something that they're running. It's like a something running within Internet Explorer. No, I was just kidding. I but, haven't but really seen it yet, but you know, if, if they just rebranded <laughs> XP, that would be kind of nice. But, but can I run IE6? Can it probably fires up an IE6 emulator. Yeah. Can it's I run like, IE6? That's all I, I care about. You, I need frames were written still. for IE6. Yeah. 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 I still need frame support. So we need to. <laughs> and they also suggest that they might have enhanced uh, support for the mouse and keyboard for those that still use them. Pasha. <laughs> Touchscreen all the way, baby. <laughs> 4K touchscreen. Uh, we uh, also, Scott posted news of a review of a Seagate Business 4-Bay NAS, a 16-terabyte motto from our friends at NitroWare. Uh, Alan, have you had any experience with um, the Seagate NAS devices? I have not. We have looked at Western Digital, but not Seagate yet. Okay. Well, Dominic over at NitroWare reviewed one and uh, gave his opinion in the process. He liked the connectivity options, shies away from recommendation without a price cut and firmware update. Its built-in software is not yet compatible with Windows 8. Probably Windows XP, but uh, maybe not Windows 8. Please buy the relatively compact chassis. 16 terabytes is a lot. USB 3.0 support in inclusion of dual gigabit Ethernet LAN ports. Configurable with RAID 0, 1, 5, 10, or JBOD. Um, which it seems odd to put JBOD into like an spaces. enterprise level NAS device, doesn't it? It's it's you always know, an option. Like it'll it'll look bad if they don't include it, even though nobody uses it. Uh, you know what's sad? Go ahead. Well, I I don't ahead. even download Internet Prawn, and so I would <laughs> utilize like one thirty seventh of that NAS sixteen device. terabytes. Sixteen terabytes. Josh, think how many bookmarks you could store. Ooh, and organize. Do you know how many drivers I could put on that? <laughs> you, just, you just save as all the web pages you go to ever when you have something. Ever. Like that. Wait, that's ever. not what you guys do? It's like, you know what? I wanted no. that Catalyst driver, the uh, you know the 9.3. 
I've got, you know, every single one for every year. I have, I probably have, 200. I probably have a nine series driver on our NAS device or a Catalyst 9. something. Okay, driver. this is sad. It, it actually is on my, on my, yeah, I was going to say, I would have already expected you to have all of those sitting there, Josh. On a, on a I've CD. still got 3D FX drivers <laughs> on my stinking on data drive. drive. You don't well, even I've, want I've to got know. them on a CD, not on the drive. Well, but it was like 128K. Come on. <laughs> well, you wouldn't be able to find them if you needed them. So now, wait. now it's good to have. Wait, wait, wait. Drivers yeah. used to be 128K? Yes. Huh. Well, and do you yeah. know how long that would take to download on a 14.4 modem? Still a couple of minutes. Uphill both ways. Uphill yes. both ways on the internet. It's the worst. On AOL. <laughs> While chatting. I think, let me double check. I think that's everything um, for the news today. We're going to go ahead and jump into our hardware software picks of the week. My pick of the week is a preview for a story that will be going up later in the week. It is this puppy right here. It's an Intel Pentium processor. Circa 1999, no, 2004. Uh, this is the Pentium G3220. Uh, I apparently purchased this item on March 12, 2014, based on my Amazon screen right here. Way to give it away. I paid, I paid all my American dollars for this. $66.62 is what you can pick it up for now. This is an LGA 1150 processor, which means it fits in... 8 series chipset, Z8 series, H8 series motherboards. Um, it's a dual core, not hyper threaded part. So two threads is all you get up to three gigahertz. It does have Intel HD graphics. I would not recommend using them for anything. Uh, it has a heat sink and fan included. It's a standard stock, low profile Intel heat sink. It's not great but it works. Um, and again, if you're building like uh, the story we're going to do that we'll talk about on next week's podcast, but you can find on our website probably in the next day or so is like a $500 gaming PC build. And it's using one of these. Uh, and it does surprisingly well for the price that you're paying. 66 bucks for a CPU uh, is pretty, it's pretty impressive. So, and we compare this to the Athlon X4 760K. So look forward to that. Jeremy, what do you got? Well, I've got a severe problem in that I cannot stop playing Goat Simulator. It is just freaking hilarious. You actually, did you actually that. pay dollars for that too? I paid dollars the second I was allowed to pay That's dollars. So I sent them an email the day when they announced it and you weren't allowed to buy it. All right. It's more than worth it. All right. Like way more than worth it. But uh, for a real pick, um, somebody built a quadcopter out of the random crap that they had lying around in their junk room. Uh, the only cheat is that to get those 120 mil fans up, he added a 24 volt DeWalt cordless tool battery. <laughs> so apparently they're running at about 15,000 RPM. <laughs> oh hey, God. Jeremy. They're not going to live long. Jeremy. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Oh, we gotta, Ken and I have to bust your bubble. Look at the date this was posted. Yeah, April I 1st. Know. I know. But I want somebody to try it because I'm pretty sure the fans will burst into flames. You know how much weight that is? <laughs> oh, yeah. But no, I want to see somebody try and attach that DeWalt to uh, the fan just to see what happens. Sparks. It will blow up. <laughs> Fire and stuff. The plastic will disintegrate into small pieces before your eyes. Or in your eyes. The, exactly. That's funny. Nice. I thought that was about the best thing I saw yesterday, uh, and I had to mention it. <laughs> okay, uh, Josh, I have your pick lined up. Alan, you can't give me all these all these links, Alan. Alan, Just I can go only... for go for the very well the middle one. The middle one, mess. Okay, Josh. I'm okay, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I had you. purchased a uh, Radeon. R7-260X from PowerColor. Mm -hmm. It was the dual fan version. It was inexpensive at the time. <clears throat> it's not inexpensive now if you can find it. But the uh, 265 has much the same design, and it's 159 bucks. Woo -woo. It's got good cooling. The only bad thing is it's not dual DVI. So really think about <clears throat> how you want to implement this card. It's not dual uh, link DVI? Well, no, it's got. It does not have dual DVI. Oh, oh, okay, okay. Yeah. So it's only got one of those and uh, what an HDMI and a Display Port. Mm -hmm. So if you want to do multi-monitor, 
I can choose carefully. Otherwise, this is a nicely performing part. It is. Two gigs of memory. Great card. And 159 bucks with good cooling. With good... Good cooling. Good cooling. Man. All right. All right, Alan, we're ready now. All right. So some of you might dabble with arcade emulation and a thing called MAME, which is Multiple Arcade Machine Emulator. Yep. Right? You guys heard of that. Uh, and then for the rest of the emulating your old things from your childhood category, right, was uh, basically just the random hodgepodge of emulators, right? If you wanted to emulate an Atari, somebody made an Atari emulator somewhere and, you know, just go down the list of emulators for various systems, right? Commodore and ColecoVision and whatever, right? So another project started up called Mess, which is like a machine emulator super system or something like that. And uh, so... And will it turn regular C++ into assembly? Ha. uh, No. Steve Gibson would pay good money for that. Yeah, I know, right? Is this hosted on GeoCities? (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so that's... And it has been since the 80s. (laughs) So they're they're actually copying the main UI page format because they made a mess UI, which is just a Windows U- GUI based version. Because the the actual emulators themselves are are command line tools usually uh, of course when, they when are. you compile them. So they take the project and someone makes a UI air quote UI version of it. So I linked in the show notes to the the mess UI version, uh, which is it gives you a nice neat front end GUI with like you know pictures of the systems and crap like that. But so this is an enormous project. Uh, at the last link in the show note line actually is the list of Ooh. all of the systems. Actually, you have you pulled it up too. Uh, the Boy. list of all the systems emulated, right? <laughs> Everything from Game Boy. There's actually original, ah. like, there's actually <laughs> older. Oh, my God. Yeah, Links. there's like um, Atari Lynx. There's Atari Lynx, right? Why? Uh, like, All those weird even, left-handed people. It even extends to like, you know those little chess, those are those old, uh, the thing you would actually buy that was like a chess uh, game. How about, how about battle, that was, chess? battle chess? That you actually, they have battle you know, chess? Yeah, they, they had the computer chess. inside of it, and you actually put the pieces on the board and moved them around, right? You remember those, right? I remember those. Well, this has those in emulation, and it brings up the actual picture of the machine, and you can click... You know, on the on the the virtualized version of the chess game and play that exact chess game. Amazing. So, yeah. So, and it goes all the way up to actual older versions of PC hardware. Mephisto. So, like, so like, there's Pentium systems and stuff like that in emulation, and then there's guides you can find where they're doing Windows 2000 server installs in them. Right. So this is like way beyond. You know. And it's all these systems conglomerated into one. Uh, now you have to get just like with Mame, you know, you're supposed to own every single one of the cabinets and whatnot. But there are places on the internet where you might be able to find, you know, say the whole set of ROMs. No, I it. doubt it. Yeah. So with Mame, that kind of stuff doesn't get on the <laughs> internet. With Mame, all of the game <laughs> ROMs are somewhere around like 50 gig worth, I think. And then if you want all of the actual hard drive images for arcade games that have hard drives in them, uh, is like another 300 gig. So that's for main. That's for just the arcade stuff. For mess, um, when you want everything, mm-hmm. you realize it's every game supported for every single platform all at the same time. It's mm-hmm. like 10 megs, right? It's like a <laughs> one and a half terabytes. Finally, a use for that raid. Yes. So there you go. Now you have Finally. the raid. <laughs> you can now emulate. I filled up my 1.5 terabytes of 16. Yeah. And it's still later to carry around than an old cabinet. Come on. But that is, that is pretty impressive to think that the amount of size worth of data for all of these very old systems has now totaled up to, between the arcade machines and the, all the other platforms, two terabytes of stuff. Man, those people back then were lazy. <laughs> They're living in an 8-bit world, Should've just man. produce more data. Just, just, just download fifty gigs of uncompressed audio files, losers. Just pad that just PS1 like game, game with today. the South Park episode. Yeah, yeah. Got to make it even. <laughs> That's pretty neat. That's pretty interesting, and highly legal. Yes. Yes. 
All right, everybody, that's going to round out our show for this week. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, please share our show. Please spread the knowledge and information and fun that is the PC Perspective podcast. Uh, send them to pcper.com slash podcast. That's where they can find this episode, previous episodes. You can download MP3 files. You can find RSS files. You can find our YouTube links. Uh, and then, again, if you want to join us when we record this live, we highly encourage it, pcper.com slash live. This is the URL where that's at. And if you want to f- sign up for those notifications, it is at pcper.com slash subscribe. Give us your name, email, and we'll let you know when we're going to do live things. There will be more live things coming in 2014. So many live things. So many live things. Uh, so with that, uh, we will round up our week. I mean, it's only Wednesday, so we're not really rounding out the week. We're rounding out this week of the podcast, I guess we'll say. Um, oh, by the way, I was told by several people on Twitter that I had to do this. I, I meant to hang this up behind me before the show started, but um, we have this. It's ham. Oh, wait. You've just now jinxed nope. UK <clears throat> in final form. If anybody's going to be in the Arlington area this weekend... I will be as well. Feel free to come up and uh, say hi as long as you're wearing UK paraphernalia. Um, and pants. And pants. You must be wearing pants <laughs> in order to walk up to me. Otherwise, police, whew, man, I got them on call. Got them on call. Uh, so uh, cheer on Kentucky uh, in the final four. Otherwise, I'll come back very depressed next week. Because you just made Michigan your bitch again. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. All right, everybody. See you next week. I'm Ryan Schraub. I'm Jeremy Holstrom. I'm Josh Walrath. And I'm Alan Malentano. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>